Finding Felicity by Lewis Kirk Chapter 5 George woke up before his alarm was scheduled to go off. This rarely happened, but it was, after all, the day of his graduation ceremony, and he felt as if he had a thousand butterflies fluttering in his stomach. Four years of hard work had culminated in him achieving his degree, and today's ceremony was the final part of the journey. He glanced out the window to look at the sky and get an idea of the weather. It looked grey, cold and overcast. A pigeon flew through the frame of his view, and for some reason he had the concept of impermanence on his mind. Thinking why this might be the case, his eyes rested on the Bhagavad Gita that he had been reading before he went to bed. Picking up the book, he opened it where he left off last night and read the part on impermanence. The key principle was neti neti atma. This is not the self, that is not the self. They would peel away at the personality as if it was an onion, layer after layer, and would find nothing truly permanent in the mass of thoughts, desires, emotions, perceptions and memories which could be called I. Even so, when everything was stripped away, an intense awareness remained, consciousness itself, unborn and undying, the ultimate core of personality, Atman, the soul, the self. Wow, George thought, I would love to keep on reading, but I'd better get a move on if I'm going to make it to the ceremony in time, and anyway, I agreed to meet Nathan early. Arriving in the entry hall of Westminster University, there were masses of students congregating in small groups dotted around the hall. The sun was shining in through the floor-to-ceiling windows and casting beautiful shadow patterns on the floor and walls of the building. George looked around at all the proud, smiling faces in the hall, searching for his small group of friends. Not seeing them on the first pass, he looked again, but more slowly and closely this time. He saw what looked like Nathan's bag from behind, and looked at the back of the owner's head, hoping to see a face he recognised. As Nathan glanced round to the left, George recognised it was him, and in the same moment could see Ali, Sarita and Anna. He made his way over to them, manoeuvring through the sea of students, all awaiting the graduation ceremony. George approached the group and poked his head into their circle. In a concert of voices, they all shouted, George! He went around each of the group, saying hi. Nathan, Sarita and Ali all replied with an ease in their manner, but Anna, for some reason or other, blushed and looked down at the floor as she was saying hello. George observed this closely. He had been in the same class as Anna for the previous three years, and had always found her attractive, but he had never seen her behave in this manner before. What was up with her? Was it him, or something going on in her personal life? With no more time to analyse the situation, Nathan clapped him on the back and said, So George, you come in for some celebratory drinks at the pub after the ceremony? There's a rumour that Professor Ospensky might even make an appearance. It's going to be awesome. Are you all going? George addressed the group. Even you, Ali, but you're not supposed to drink. On a blessed day like this, I hope Allah will forgive me for joining my friends in celebration, Ali replied. So are you going to come then? Anna probed further, holding George's gaze as she spoke. The human connection in that moment made George feel more alive than he had for a while. He fidgeted and was clearly uncomfortable in his own mind and body before replying, I wasn't planning on doing anything after but I might pop in for a couple to celebrate with you guys. George did not make a habit of drinking in the pub. He preferred his own company, smoking and reading at home. This being said, like many young Englishmen, he was a binge drinker. He wouldn't go out often, but when he did, one day could easily bleed over into the next. Have you heard about the increase in accidents at the local factory recently? It's been all over my social media feed, Sarita inquired to the group with a concerned look on her face. Doesn't your mum work there, George? Nathan added excitedly. Yeah, it's getting really bad. The other day my mum got disciplined for keeping her partner, a machine, I should add, waiting for too long. She was well pissed, as you can imagine. She says that they are trying to increase efficiency, but not following the health and safety policies. Something terrible is bound to happen soon. The following moment, cutting their discussion short, an authoritative voice came from across the hall. 
Can everyone please get into your positions, please? Remember the order we have arranged to come up and get your certificates. It was Professor Espensky organising the cohort into their positions. The students erupted into a bluster of noise and movement, and George's gang began moving to their place in the order. As they walked towards where they would be queuing, George glanced into the main hall and looked at all of the people sitting in the audience. The hall was packed, bursting at full capacity, and there was a low hum of muffled voices and bodies moving nervously. Where the group found themselves in the line, their position was in the middle portion of the queue snake. The head and front quarter was in the hall, with the three quarters down to the tail, waiting outside. I can't believe we are finally here, Anna commented in a flurry of emotion. All of our hard work culminates in this ceremony, and then our whole lives ahead of us. As these words flowed out of her mouth, her eyes met George's, and they both reactively looked down at the floor. What the hell is wrong with you two today? Ali mocked. I've never seen you guys like this. Maybe it's the emotion of the situation. Or maybe Allah has had his servant, Cupid, shoot arrows through both of your hearts. Cupid is the mythological god of love, Ali, George retorted. You can't believe in other gods and still believe in Allah. Ali shrugged, and George left it at that. The cue snake was moving, slithering into the hall, and the part of the body that contained the group was just about to enter the hall. If they pushed and shoved, they were able to get a glimpse at the crowd. They all looked at the part of the queue, waiting just below the steps to go up on stage to get their certificates, and a few of them gave a nervous whoop in unison. The next moment they were just inside the hall, ever so close to the conclusion of their life at university. George scanned the crowd for a familiar face. There was an ocean of faces out there. How could he possibly distinguish one that he knew? He moved his eyes slowly over all the distinct eyes, ears, noses and chins, moving from left to right and back again, and then suddenly, could it be? He saw Nan. He felt a wave of emotion. He couldn't believe she had made it. She said there was a possibility, but George doubted she would come. George tapped Nathan, who was standing the closest to him. Nathan, Nathan, my Nan is here. She made it. Where? Show me. George had glanced at Nathan to tell him the good news, but when he looked back out at the sea of faces, right at the spot where his nan should have been standing, she was nowhere to be seen. She was right there, George said with an air of the frantic in his voice. She's here. I saw her. All right, mate, calm down. I'm sure she is here. You can go and find her after, Nathan consoled him somewhat. Their part of the snake was edging closer to the stage now, and it wouldn't be long before it was George's turn to go up and collect his certificate. But he wasn't interested in the ceremony right now. He was searching the audience to find his nan. With such urgency, nothing else mattered. George Temple! George Temple! George felt a shove on his arm. It was his turn to go up and receive his certificate. The frenzy abated, and he looked up at Professor Espensky's round face and proceeded to walk up the steps across the stage to collect his award. He shook Espensky by the hand and took his certificate in the other. It's been a pleasure teaching you these years, George. I have really valued your insight and contribution to the course. The professor whispered into his ear. Thanks, George said with an embarrassed smirk on his face. As George made his way over to his group of friends, he couldn't bathe in and enjoy the moment, to take in fully this chapter-concluding part of his life. His attention went straight back to the crowd in an attempt to see if he could spot his nan. No joy. The group was escorted off the stage by one of the faculty George didn't recognise, and the ceremony was over. For them, anyway. The energy in the air was one of exuberance and freedom. Everyone was overwhelmed to have come to the end of their educational journey, but George found himself outside of this bubble of joy and happiness. He had one thing on his mind, to find his nan. He had seen her, hadn't he? She wasn't a premonition or a phantom his mind had created. These rational considerations did not enter into George's mind. He was overtaken by a manic desire to find his nan. He was completely convinced in his own mind that she was on the premises and he was determined to find her. You come in for a celebration meal of us, George, before we head up the pub? Nathan asked. No, I can't. I have to find my nan. I'm sure she's here. I know she is. I might see you guys later. 
George sped off towards the building. A crowd of people, the friends and family of all of the graduating students, were flowing out from the main entrance. He pushed his way through them, without regard for anyone, almost knocking over a small child. Hey! screamed the mother at him. Watch where you're going, you idiot! George didn't even acknowledge their existence. With such a large building to search, where was he to start? He made his way back into the university and towards the hall that the ceremony took place in. People were still streaming out, and there were some congregating just outside the door. George barged past them and into the hall and quickly looked around. Nothing. He dashed out into the main entrance and set off down one of the corridors. What was he hoping to find? It was very unlikely that his nan would be wandering about the halls and corridors of the university. He ran to the end of the corridor, his emotions running wild. Getting to the end, he turned left and continued running, blindly searching for who knows what. He arrived at the end of another long, empty corridor, and just happened to be standing outside the room where some of his lectures would be conducted. Stopping to catch his breath, he considered the idea that maybe he hadn't seen her. Was it just his imagination? Stopping to consider this fact allowed the adrenaline that was coursing through his veins to flush out of his system in an abrupt dump, and he suddenly felt drained. He couldn't even summon the energy to stand. He was feeling faint and needed to sit down. Making his way in through the open door, he pulled out a chair and sat down with his head in his hands. After several minutes of breathing deeply and calming himself down, he suddenly awoke from the frenzied fog he had been consumed by. Coming to his senses, his rational mind came back online and he saw reality for what it was. I must have imagined it, he thought to himself, silly fool. Getting up to leave and thinking about going to join the group, he pulled out the phone from his pocket to find out where they were and as he looked at the screen it started ringing. His mum was calling. Hey mum, how are you? You all right? George asked absent-mindedly, wanting his mum to get off the line so he could call his friends. There was a horrendous noise coming down the phone. It was so loud and disturbing that George could hardly work out what was going on. Mom, what's that noise? Are you all right? Another moment or so passed and he could make out that the noise was actually coming from his mum. She was howling and wailing in an unconsolable agony. Mom, what is it? The only two words that George could make out amongst all of the sobbing and weeping were, She's dead! and then nothing decipherable amidst the noise for several more moments. Who's dead? George shouted down the phone in a frustrated tone. Mom, calm down, I can't understand you. Who's dead? The reply came clearly and with such a force that he felt like he had been punched hard in the stomach by a champion heavyweight boxer. Nan's dead! The phone dropped to the floor and bounced before switching off due to the impact. Time stopped. George felt as though all of the life had been sucked out of him. He felt numb and empty. Sitting down in a chair, he didn't know what was happening in his mind and awareness. Reality and his expectations of reality had fractured and it was painful to breathe. Twenty minutes passed and still nothing made any sense in his mind. The one inevitability in life, death. George had inquired and philosophised about this regularly throughout his university course while investigating various philosophical schools of thought. It wouldn't help him now, in the moment when he needed it most. The reality was like nothing he could have ever anticipated. No amount of meditation and contemplation could have prepared him for this moment and what this very instant in time would mean in his life. Every event, by its very nature, must become a cause. Every event, whether mental or physical, will affect something else. Cause and effect. The sun rises so that it can set. The moon waxes so it can one day wane. We wake up so that we can go to sleep. We are born and the one truth in life is that we will one day die. George was struck dumb and he felt completely numb. He couldn't breathe. It was like he was submerged in a vast expanse of cold water, struggling to get a full breath. The weight of his agonising grief was felt as a physical reality. The gravity of the earth increased by 20%. There was only one thing he could think of that would help. Escaping his consciousness and getting drunk into oblivion.